Good morning, everybody. I'm Suzanne Held. I'm speaking later. I'm the chair for today. And uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Fan Cicek Baluska here from the um, University of Bonn, from the um, Institute of Integrative and Cellular um, Plant Sciences. And he's going to talk to us, kick off the day, talking to us about what a plant knows and perceives. Do you want to go? Yep. Thank you, Susan, very much. And Stephen, thank you for your very kind invitation for this very nice summer school. I will give you some overview about plants. And of course, this is still highly controversial in our mainstream plant sciences. So we are struggling, but we are improving. So since 2005, when we started this initiative, we are quite having quite nice progress. And I would also like to introduce Stefano Mancuso, with whom I started all this in 2005. There was a, a first conference on plant neurobiology at the University of Florence in Italy. And he is also director of this Lind Institute of uh, International Laboratory of Plant Neurobiology in Firenze. And unfortunately, I don't see the mouse. I cannot. Okay. So. I have some problem because I don't see, it is not possible to see the mouse there. So when I, or have some, someone a pointer. Yeah, but it is not visible, the mouse is not visible, but I will get a pointer. Okay, sorry. It's okay. So Stefano Mancuso is a director of the LINF. It is an international laboratory of plant neurobiology. And we are in a very close contact since 2002 or three. And I would like to just start with this uh, few ideas, which I think are really crucial for also all these problems. If the animals outside of human or the lower animals or even some kind of a lower system like eukaryotes or plants can be cognitive. So a normal optimal strategy in science is to start your analysis with the simple systems and only then to move on to more complex systems. But unfortunately in life sciences, we started with the humans and then only later we started also to study less complex system, systems. And this unhappy situation is causing now these fundamental problems and misunderstandings because uh, fundamental Biological phenomena like learning, memory, cognition, sentience, maybe, and others are reserved for humans. And any attempts to expand these basic fundamental biological concepts to other organisms is very difficult. And of, of course, often it is called also anthropomorphism, although I think that anthropocentrism is more toxic like anthropomorphism. So everything with the science started with Aristoteles and he, as yesterday, Lori was also showing this nice cartoon. It's the great chain of beings and scala natura. So the plants were placed by Aristoteles very close to stones and minerals. Of course, also Aristoteles was not very much aware about the roots. So he saw just the shoot part of the plants. But what is quite strange and unique, if you open Wikipedia and the largest organisms on the earth, or even Encyclopedia Britannica, you will find out that even now the roots are ignored. So we'll you will find for sequoia tree, 120, 30 meters size, but the tree is having a root system, which is proportion one to one. So if you should have not 120 meters, but maybe 300 meters. But if you see the Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia, you will find out just the shoot part as if the root is not existent, which is very strange even today. And the Carl von Linnaeus system then somehow made this uh, system very stable and it is very difficult now to somehow fight against it. It was somehow interesting to see that big, very strong figures like uh, Luigi Galvani, for example, was the first one who started with the frogs experiments and he showed that there is a bioelectricity and irritability. And it is not well known, but Alexander von Humboldt was repeating many of the experiments and he was also using plants. And he was the first one to suggest that there is some basic biological system principle, which is based on this bioelectricity of living system. 
And I will show you at the end that the major neurotransmitter in animals, humans, are also acting as the neurotransmitters in plants. We have first evidences also for the glutamate receptors in plants and GABA receptors in plants these days. So the next uh, quite big figure was the professor of physiology. He, in fact, initiated the whole physiology. Uh, and Claude Bernard was studying also plants. And he was using anesthetics uh, and in these studies. And he concluded that the anesthesia is a unifying principle of life. So what is uh, living can be anesthetized. And what is not living is not sensitive to anesthetics. This was his unitary view of the life on the basis of anesthetics experiments. And I will show you at the end also our recent paper study where we show very clearly that the principle of movements based on electricity, bioelectricity, action potentials is ex exactly the same in plants as in animals and humans. So the next, next very important character was Sir J.C. Boz who also used anesthetics and also studied bioelectricity. He was originally a physicist, but then he moved to plants and he was very clever. He made many nice instruments and published several books. There are three here just dealing with the plants, but there are more of them. And he also was somehow convinced that this bioelectricity is the basic principle which makes the unity of life possible throughout all systems. So now I'm moving to the plants, and I would like to briefly introduce you, maybe you're not so aware about evolution of plants. So they are so-called lower plants, although they are, I would say, not lower. They are also very highly evolved, but they are called lower because they are more simple. And then uh, at the end, we have these vascular plants, where we have uh, the seed plants. And the last addition was these flowering plants, where we have the uh, flowers and the uh, fruits. And this was the flowering plants, plants started to be emerging on the planet Earth very similarly together with the mammals. And what is very interestingly, they were very successful from the very beginning. And it seems that this, this uh, flowering plants initiated so-called, I would say, I would call it behavioral phase of plant evolution, because in order to sexually reproduce, they need animals, they need insects. And in order to recruit animals, insects, they need to somehow provide them with something attractive. So attractive means uh, food, or sometimes it is even not the food, but sometimes it is just some nice color or shape. And this sudden emergence or burst of this very high diversity of these flowering plants, so from now 350 approximately known plants, the flowering plants make up 99% of all species, so they, have, they are extremely diverse. And this evolutionary success seems to be related to their ability to their ability to have some cognitive features and behavior and communicate with animals, especially insects, birds, but also with mammals. And you can see here that emergence of these flowering plants and the diversity was associated with also increase in diversity of insects, birds, and mammals. So somehow, when the flowering plants emerged on the planet Earth, everything dramatically changed and also insects, birds and mammals start to be much more diverse. And of course, everybody knows they use the flowers to attract these pollinators. And uh, but what is very important here to know that it is not just promising of a food or some other, but they also are able to uh, especially in case of orchids, I will not go into very details now, but they can somehow somehow pretend so they just pretend there is some food or some some uh, something good but in fact there is nothing good so there there is a very nice example that these orchids plants can completely fool the insects and uh, somehow get this uh, service done even if there is no no uh, food pro provided so they use not only the food and but also some olfactory cues also colors uh, forms. So in some way, they must have some very good information knowledge about the potential pollinators that they can really use all these kinds of uh, uh, cues. And uh, even furthermore, even more complex it is with the ants, which there are many, many trees which are having some very tight connection to the ants. And this acacia tree in Africa, for example, they provide the ants with this 
small globules which are filled with nectar, but not only nectar, there seems to be some addictive substances. Uh, the nature we still don't know exactly. So since the ant is licking once this globule, the ant will stop to eat anything else. So you, you can give them sugar, anything, everything will be removed and the ants will stay on the tree forever and they will just uh, eat these globules or lick these globules. So these ants are somehow due to eating these globules and this licking these uh, next substances which are in the globules, which you still don't know exactly how they, what they are, they will be more or less slaves of the tree and they will protect the tree from any, any possible herbivore or any other elements who would like to just touch the tree. So they are even getting much more aggressive as they normally are and they attack even big animals like giraffes if they are coming to the leaves of these trees. There are also many other systems with the ants and trees. Most, many of them are also three, three symbiotic uh, assemblies, plants, ants, fungi, sorry, fungi, but I will not go into details now here. But again, also, of course, even mammals are attracted by these plants with flowers and fruits. And Michael Pollan in his book was also proposing speculative view that maybe this, uh, what we say, our domestication of our crop plants, and we use them also as a good, of course, like uh, it was yesterday shown with the chicken, but this plant seems to be more clever, so there seems not to be so much suffering. And in fact, the maize is also annual plant, so the humans kill, don't kill the plant, in fact, because the plant is finishing the life cycle when there is a harvest, but uh, Again, as Michael Pollan was saying, it is not so clear if we have domesticated the maize or if the maize domesticated us. And uh, it seems to be a clear example of co-evolution because we are also affected by eating maize. We also still don't know, as I mentioned, everything what is inside of this maize grain. We have no real idea, but it tastes perfectly, so it must have also something which is stimulating our tongue and our brain. So it is, uh, I think, much more complex uh, with these crop plants. They are also somehow influencing us. And with maize, it's also very, very interesting because maize emerged, emerged from nothing some 10,000 years. So it is one of the youngest species on planet, I think, which is known. And mysteriously, we still are not sure from which plant the maize was evolving. So there are some speculative proposals theory and so on, but it is still not completely sure. So the maize just suddenly jumped out and was here, complete plant, and we have still not real good ideas how it happened. And the next very strong issue with the maize is that the maize is the only plant which cannot reproduce by itself. So it needs to have a human intervention. So if the human would stop to interact with maize, this plant would be out from evolution. So it is extremely tightly connected to us. And this happened just some 10,000 years ago. It is uh, really not a long time ago. So again, with the plants, if they are eaten by herbivores and uh, herbivores are too much hungry, so the plant starts to make some very strong uh, responses, which are first they try to make it not very tasty, and, but if it doesn't help, they start to, for example, there are many plants which are able to recruit so-called bodyguards, which are, in fact, other insects which are killing the herbivores. And, for example, a very known no example are these parasitoic wasp, which inject the, uh, in the, into, the, into the herbivores, there's uh, young developing parasitoids, which are then eating up the herbivores from inside. And another very nice example, published recently this year is that the tomato plants overeaten by caterpillars can secrete some chemicals which turn the caterpillars into cannibals. So the vegetarian caterpillars become cannibals when they overeat these tomato plants. So the plants are really very powerful if they are in a bad situation and they can, they can really be also dangerous for animals. So here is the small caterpillars eaten by a large one. 
Uh, another nice example of uh, communication of plants uh, with some kind of olfactory cues is this parasitic weed, which is finding cuscuta, which is able to find host plant, which is in this case, again, tomato plants, just by navigation using some olfactory cues. And these parasitic plants then are somehow controlling this host plant and don't need to make any photosynthesis anymore, and they are provided by the food by this parasitic plant. So these were some examples from plant behavior and plant abilities somehow. Sometimes they are even, it seems that they are much higher level like in insects, for example, so that they control insects, they can make the slaves from the insects. They can change the behavior of these herbivores completely if needed. But now I would like to go to roots because this is my major uh, topic, which I'm studying some 30 years and uh, where I am a real expert. And I will start with the Charles Darwin, which is the next very strong character who was in favor of plant, uh, I would not say neurobiology, but in favor of plants having disabilities. And in the book, uh, which was the last one we published, Power of Movements in Plants in 1880, and his son Francis at the time, young guy who was doing experiments according Charles' instructions. Later, Francis was also a very famous uh, plant biologist. And they, uh, at the end of the book, they made this very strong statement that it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the tip of the radical acts like a brain of the lower animal. And the second statement was that the brain of this root tip is at the anterior end of the whole plant body. So Charles and Francis concluded that the root tip acts as a brain of the lower animal. And the second statement, it is anterior pole, the root tip of plant of the whole plant body. And so if you will think about this, then you we will come up with such a cartoon when we would be a plant, we would be also not moving because our heads would be also in soil. And of course, in plants, when you think, when you think a little bit about it, this, this is quite convincing because the opposite pole is the posterior, posterior pole where the plants is having flowers and flowers are nothing else, just sexual organs. So it fits quite together. So the root tip is looking, searching for the nutrition, for the water minerals, and the opposite pole is dealing with the sexual reproduction. So uh, my interest in this plant neurobiology field started because when I was studying the root gravity response, and we realized that there are sensory events at the very tip of the root apex, but there are motoric events which are relatively far away from the tip. And there in between are two zones, which are also very important. I will show you later some cartoon. First, we have a big group of cells which divide meristematically, meristem. And then is a zone which we discovered in 1990, which is now called transition zone. And all, only after transition zone is the so-called elongation region, where then the bending of the root happens, root tip. So there is a quite big dis distance. And it was also found that there are electric responses after gravity stimulation in the tip. And these electric responses are moving the signal from the tip to the elongation region to initiate bending. So this is the cartoon of the maze root. Uh, I was not showing here there should be still a root cap, but I was leaving this out. The, in the red, you see that cells in division, meristematic cells. In green are these elongating cells which are in, in fact full of the waterfall vacuole. And this elongation is an extremely rapid process. So you can imagine that cells passing out from the division zone requires some three days, two days to get here. But in order to get here, to, from here to here, they need just two hours. So it is like explosive growth because the cells suddenly uh, accumulate a huge amount of water, which makes a huge vacuole. And the nuclei, which are shown here in red, are then pushed to the side, to the cell wall. In this zone, in, in transition zone, the nuclei are all the time in the middle, which is very important for the sensory abilities. And they are kept in the middle by cytoskeleton actin and microtubules. So in the 1990s, we published this paper where we discovered this zone for the first time. Now, if you go into the literature, you will find many papers, not just in maize, but in model plant Arabidopsis too, and we renamed this, this zone to transition zone in 96. And what is also important here, these two red stars indicate the phloem element, which are shown here, these two lines. 
phloem element are bringing photosynthate from the shoot, from leaves to the root tip in order to propel, to provide it root tip with the nutrition. And these cells here in transition zone are really flooded with the sucrose. Sucrose is the photosynthate, which is bringing the nutrition there. And these cells are really in a very good situation, flooded with a lot of sucrose, which is, I think, very critical issue for this, for understanding how the root apex is working. And another issue which is very important for the so-called sensory motoric integration, because as I mentioned, we have the gravity perception somewhere here in the root cap, which is not shown. And then there is a response somewhere here. And this happens within a few minutes. And it is really necessary to have action potentials running here. Still, it is not clearly described how it is working, but there is some very rapid electric signaling here. And also this auxin, it's a small molecule similar chemically to the serotonin or melatonin. This auxin is uh, firstly studied as a, trans, uh, as a hormone, plant hormone, but now we have information and data that it is also a transmitter-like substance. So it is like transmitter because auxin is transported from cell to cell. And if it hits out next cells uh, from outside, it induces electrical responses. So electrophysiological events induced by sensor experience are upstream of the hormonal responses and the gene expression. And the auxin as a transmitter is central molecule here, and it controls the sensory motoric integration. So if the cell-cell transport for auxin is blocked due to, for example, some chemicals, then the root is still growing down, but it cannot respond to stimuli. So it cannot grab, make a gravity response it makes positive gravity response or negative photo response, it will be not be able to do this. And even if one of these transporters, there are several which are driving these auxin flows, if one of these, the pin two, is also knocked out in Arabidopsis seedlings roots, then these roots are not able to respond to signals from the environment. They will be just growing without any direction, but they will grow, but they will not be able to respond to gravity, light, and other, other cues. So the auxin is the central element. And then in 2009, we published this paper where we showed using this multi-electrode arrays, arrays, which are normally used for neurons, but the maze segments could be also somehow used in this system. And we could show that this transition zone is a hotspot for electric activities. So it's a very, very active zone for, from point of view of action potential and spikes. And also this zone is controlling the elongation uh, responses, motoric responses in the elongation region. And another feature of this transition zone, this is uh, mostly studies for, made in Stefano Mancuso lab. The cells in these zones are acting very similarly to the sensory motoric networks in brains, which were synchrony oscillatory patterning of anatomically group, group neurons drive sensory motoric network. So we have also here synchronous oscillations of anatomically grouped root cells. And again, this transition zone is very mysterious zone because cells are not dividing anymore. They are not elongating still, and they seem to be extremely active from the point of view of cytoskeleton, vesicle trafficking. And uh, all this somehow is fitting to the Darwin's theory that the root tip acts as a brain. And this transition zone seems to be very important zone in this respect. So we have in this zone oscillations of electric activities, membrane transport fluxes, transport or uptake or of oxygen, auxin, uh, other, other signaling molecules. And also there is oscillation in gene expression in this zone. So we also proposed in this paper in 2013 that we maybe could call this zone also oscillatory zone. So just about uh, root system, I don't know how far you are informed, but these root systems can be really, really complex. In evolution, first plants were having a very simple root system, but with evolution, the root system are still more and more complex. And in monocots, which is also the case of our crop plants, maize, but for example, here, lolium multiflorum, you can see that the shoot part is quite small here, and the root system is extremely, extremely complex. And at the tip of every dig, this root, you have this root tip zone with this transition zone and root cap. So there are numerous, numerous root tips, and all these root tips are connected in one system using uh, this 
a system of vascular elements which studied our uh, implants mostly from the point of view of transport of water minerals from root to shoot or photosynthate sucrose from shoot to root. But this vascular system are also extremely active in this electric activity. So they act as a neuronal network, in fact, and they make, they integrate the whole plant body into one unit. So they connect all the tips of the root here and all the tips of the shoots in one unit. And what, what is also important here is that this is a very plastic, phenotypically plastic network. It's just changed according to local situation, water or absence of water or some stone if there is there or some toxic areas. So it is shaped by the sensory experience at the root tips. And the roots in contrast to shoots show many features which are, we can say animal-like. So they are able to self, non-self and kin recognition. They show some kind of a swarming behavior. They are able to escape from dangerous areas even before they grow into these areas, for example, in salt, salt stress situation, it is shown. So they grow around the salty area, they avoid it. Or they have also avoidance tropism. If they already are in this dangerous zone, they find a way out of it. So they show also avoidance tropism. And of course, they have a root to root communication on the basis of this vascular system, but also on the basis of volatiles. They release volatiles all, all the time, roots, but also shoots. And the roots also release exudates. A lot of lot of organic stuff is released from the plants, and they maintain somehow the properties of the, of the soil, which are very important for them. And they control also the bacterial communities and other animals living in the soil very very precisely. And they all the time solve problems with so-called root decisions. So this is the view from the top, for example. You can see that every plant, the root system is somehow claiming from the space, is having its own sphere of influence. Somehow, sometimes they are having borders between them, sometimes not. So it depends. Sometimes two plants are very friendly together and they can then share the space together. But there are also situations where the plants don't like each other and they are keep these spheres of influence very, very precisely. And at the very extreme situation, they can kill the other plants by releasing very toxic substances, mostly from the roots. So they can really kill the other plants. Uh, with respect to this decision, this was quite a nice experiment. One of the first one after Darwin's experiments, but very similar to what Darwin was doing in 1880, published by Massa Gilroy in 2003. Very simple experiment. The root was growing downwards and there was some, some barrier here. So the root was hitting the barrier with the tip and not able to grow forward. And what the root is doing then, it is making bending, two bending zones, in fact, are in the roots. The first bending zone you can see somewhere here is at the end of the elongation zone. And this bending lifts up the root tip a little bit. And then the root tip grows a little bit forward. And there is another bending, they call it DZ here, but this is the transition zone bending. And there is another attempt to grow down. If it doesn't work, the, everything is repeated. And the root is somehow progressing forward, forward and finding the weak place to grow down. Uh, I was together with Stefano uh, somehow reviving this root brain hypothesis of Charles and Francis Darwin, where we somehow put together all new data, very strongly supporting the hypothesis. This is just one of the papers, not from our uh, initiative, but also mainstream, mainstream scientists sometimes are coming already now with such a papers like this, this from PNAS where they speak about brain-like decision-making command center in root apex, controlling break of dormancy in Arvidopsis seeds. Uh, with respect of the roots, so I show you this root system is very complex. So and each root tip is having a task to finding water, finding mineral nutrition, which is very critical for the plant. And they really traverse huge distances. It is, it is not so easily to believe, but sometimes they are, from the human perspective, if you would be a root tip, you would walk maybe 5,000 kilometers to what the roots are spanning, the distances from, from on the basis of the size. And this uh, soil is very complex environment, sometimes very dangerous, because if the root tip is too long in dry area, it will dry out, or in toxic area, so they must be very careful where to grow. And also these root epices are very expensive organs for the whole plant. 
So when there is a wrong root decision, wrong bending, mostly they are penalized by phloem. I showed you these red dots at the end of the phloem in the root tip, which is releasing the sucrose. And if the root tip is making wrong decisions, the release of sucrose will be blocked. So the root is penalized by not getting enough nutrition. And so loser roots, which are many, making many mistakes, they are penalized by completely switching off of the phloem unloading, and then they are just discarded. So these uh, root decisions, root bending, are very, very important issues for the, for the root tip. And I would like now to show you, this is just from the paper we published recently, or recently, two years ago. This was, in fact, first, first, for the first time shown by Han et al. And I will show you now a movie of a root growing on the slope. And you, just to get you some idea how this root is growing, and you will see that this is a sequence of maybe 36 hours. And you can see that the, can, can we repeat this? Maybe because it goes like maybe two times or three times. And you can see that the tip is all the time making again these attempts to grow down. We put them on the slope. And if the slope is upward, then you can see nicely this growing like movements. If we remove the cap, we can surgically remove the cap. Darwin was also doing experiments. Then the root is just growing straight up and not, not, not making this searching behavior movements. So just to have some idea that these root movements, if we just speed up the time, look very similar to animal movements. OK, thank you very much. So the difference between plants and animals is mostly just the time problem. So we are living in a different time, st space time a little bit. The plants are doing everything on a smaller scale from outside. But inside of the cell, the movements in cells are as, as, as fast as in animals and humans even faster. So the cytoplasmic streaming is in plant cells extremely fast. So from the point from this point of view, the plants are all the time moving, but inside of the of the of the cell. And then we make uh, because these maize roots are very nice, we, they are very robust, they survive all kinds of experiments. So we inserted them into these capillaries and we we were curious to see if they will grow against the gravity because normally they should grow down. But the maize root, as I will show you here, they, they grow against the gravity. And in the end, they would grow out. I will show you later some images. But only if they are in darkness. So as soon as we illuminate them, they, they bend. And they bend even in these very thin capillaries. In order to bend, they really need to change the morphogenesis and development of the root tip. So they're getting thinner, thinner in order to bend. And also, they synthesize a lot of anthocyanins because the light is for the root very bad. And if we remove the root cap, you remember when I was speaking about the crawling, the crawling is gone, but the root continues to grow. So if we remove the cap, the root bend, don't bend and grow up even in, in light. And also, the amount of anthocyanins is lower. So the cap, root cap is a very crucial issue for the behavior of crawling, and, but also to respond to this, to light. And Ken, Ken Yokawa was a postdoc in my lab, and he was then also doing some other experiments. And everything indicates that these uh, roots are really actively exploring any available space. One could say with some kind of curiosity. So they are just approaching the inner side of the capillaries and trying to find out what is the space available there. And if they grow out of the capillaries, they continue in these searching movements even when they are outside. So they have definitely also some kind of tactile sense, and they have able, using this sense, have ideas what is the space which is available for them. And this is very important. So maize is different like most plants, because most plants would never grow out up against the gravity, even in darkness. They would turn down the gravity. So the maize is maize root are not slaves of the gravity anymore. If they are not illuminated, they explore any possible space available in soil and grow also against, against the gravity upwards. Uh, another system which can also designed, uh, we place the roots in the petri dishes, quadratic, and we make them some possibility to decide if to grow to right or left, according to some chemicals which were placed there. And interestingly, we find out that ethylene and ether are, and darkness, of course, are attracting. So if the ethylene or ether or darkness was provided in one of the chamber, then the, all the roots grow there. 
On the other hand, methyl jasmonate salt and light were, was having a repelling impact on the roots. So using such simple system, we can now start to analyze preferences of the roots. And uh, we published this paper in 2014, and we call this binary decisions on maize behavior. Of course, you, you can design much more complex mazes and study more, more complicated situation settings. Interestingly, acylene and ether, I will come at the end to the anesthetics area, but acylene and ether both are anesthetics. It is not so well known that acylene is anesthetics, but it was even used in surgeries in 1930s, and only due to some very unhappy accident they were stopped to use because there were some, uh, they are flammable. But otherwise, and the plants release ethylene and ether when they are under stress. But I will come to, to this later. Uh, another paper published recently uh, was very nicely shown that if the maize seedlings are gently touched once a day here, then the information was provided to the other plants, nearby plants, using root exudates. I told you that the roots are also releasing volatiles, but also exudates. So the root exudates then informed another plants, nearby plants, that some mechanical stimuli are coming from one side of the, for example, field. Interestingly, in field, if there is some herbivore attack on one end, the plants increase the immunity there, and but they inform the whole field, all plants in the field, about this accident, and the plants then induce the immunity up. Normally, the plants, when they would like to grow, they have very low immunity because they cannot, it is energetically not possible to have high immunity and to grow. But uh, using this system, they can warn themselves and then they can increase the immunity, but of course, they will be then, the harvest will be lower if there will be this attack continuing. Uh, I told you these roots uh, don't like the light, but the light is penetrating into the soil, into the substrate. There is a gradient of light there. And this is very important because we, we discovered this FOT1 receptor, uh, which is a blue light receptor in the transition zone specifically, arranged in this U-shaped pattern. This is the epidermis without any FOT1 expression in the blue light receptor, but only in cortex is shown this, this pattern. And this FOT1 is controlling the auxin transport via this pin 2. I told you this is the only auxin transporter which is necessary. If this is knocked out, the root is not able to make any behavior. And it seems that this pin 2 behavior is controlled by the FOT1 according to the light. And uh, we believe now that this FOT1 here is somehow a central issue for the root to respond to the, to the light. And uh, what is interestingly also uh, that the other photoreceptors are expressed more in root cap and uh, meristem, but the FOT1 is specifically expressed in this transition zone. And uh, now we are doing these experiments with my students, which are, which are implicating that the root maybe is able of some kind of a vision. So we are placing, we have a tap petri dish which is partly darkened and partly on the light. And if we put the root in the middle between the dark and light spot, they grow towards dark, of course, because they prefer darkness. But then we moved the placing of the seedlings away from the dark, light dark border, and we find out that even when their roots are 32 millimeters somewhere here, so 32 millimeters from the border, and they are fully bathed by light, the root can still know where is the dark part, where is the dark side, and they grow towards the darkness. So this is what we now call the root scototropism. Until now, there is only one paper on scototropism in plants. Scoto is from ancient Greek, uh, grow towards dark. Scot, oops, sorry. Scot is da scototo is darkness. So, and this was shown in a paper from 75 for host tree location by tropical wine, and they called it scototropism. So this is the single paper until, until now published on this, but now we believe that roots are also able to do this and we think that this uh, special arrangement of FOT1, where the FOT1 is showing this U-turn pattern and uh, there is epidermis without any, any FOT1 expression, this fits very nicely with the theory of uh, Oselli, which was proposed by Gottlieb von Haberland in 91-95, two books in German, not in English, but this uh, books, uh, this is maybe the central statement so, and, but he was working not with the roots, but with shoots, but he was proposing this also on the basis, but my last experiments with removed epidermis, 
again, epidermis is also in the root without FOT1, reveal that epidermis cells at the upper part act as a plant convex lens. A special light spreading is perceived as a light perception. So the epidermis cells also in here in the roots, not expressing any FOT1, are in a very perfect position to act as a lens and to somehow focus the light images on the FOT1 based light sensitive areas in the, in the next tissue, in the cortex tissue. And somehow we think that this plant oxaloid concept proposed just for the shoots and leaves can really be working also in, in roots. And this is another issue where the plant vision might be implicated. This is a very strange plant from South America jungle, Boquila wine. And this, is, uh, this plant, this wine is mimicking shape of the leaves of the host plants. What is very unique is that even three different kinds of leaves, shape of the leaves, if, the, if he's having three different hosts because this uh, vine is really growing very long, so it can traverse several hosts. And it all the time it changes the shape of the leaves according to the host uh, plant. And so you can see, for example, here two examples of the same Bokila leaves in different plants, but also we can see that there can be also different shapes. And the authors proposed theory, speculative, that this uh, mimicking of the leaf shape and leaf color, because it, co it mimics also color, not just shape, and also size and, sh and orientation of the leaves so without having, this is important, any contact, direct contact with the host plant. So authors preferred chemical explanation that some kind volatile released by host plant give the information necessary to make this mimicking of the leaves. But we think that this chemical explanation is failing for mimicking these physical parameters like uh, shape or, or size or orientations. And we, pre we would prefer maybe this plant specific possibly theory for this very unique mimicry. Uh, I, with respect of plant mimicry, I also very important, uh, very interesting issue is, for example, with our crop plants, there are weeds inside these crop plants, which are mimicking the crop plants. Somehow these weeds are aware what kind of shape they should get in order not to be removed from, from the field by humans. So they are also making very perfect mimicry of the crop plants. And the next uh, very surprising also issue is now the root phonotropism. So it seems that roots are also able to perceive sounds and also not just perceive the sounds, but they can also orient, orient the growth and tropism according to the sound. And for example, 200 hertz were, in, were shown to be inducing definitely positive phototropism, phonotropism, sorry, both in maize root and Arabidopsis roots. And this 200 hertz is approximately sound of a water, streaming water. So maybe this uh, uh, phonotropism, root phonotropism is important in soil to find the uh, water. This is one possibility, of course, speculative. But the, another very interesting issue is that, uh, of course, this paper was published in our group, but also another paper was already published by group of Monica Gagliano in Australia. So there are more and more of, on these studies coming now. And you know that these uh, roots of some trees are even causing very bad damages to pipes in our houses. And it might be that this is also the reason why they're they can maybe hear the sounds of the streaming water and they try to get into the pipe and they damage then the pipe. Uh, but the maize root are even going further. So we published just very preliminary data, but unfortunately it was, this was not continued this project with Dan, Robert Daniel a group in Bristol, where he, has, uh, he is expert on the uh, voc uh, sound uh, biology of insects. And we, when we place the roots, maize root growing into his chambers, the root apex of maize is inducing, uh, pro, uh, generating a clicking sounds in a very regular fashion, which uh, we still don't know how these clicking sounds are produced, but they are produced by the tip. And it could be that the root of maize is using them as a kind of a root apex sonar because the sound waves give the information what is in and ahead, if is there water or dry area, the response of the sound waves will be different, or if there is a stone. So it might be that similar like bats are used sound waves for navigating darkness, that the roots are doing something very similar. And this would be the next surprising if this could be confirmed. 
And with respect to plan hearing, this is also a very important paper published in group of Apple, Heidi Apple, where uh, they show that the herbivores eating leaves reduce some sound waves too, and the nearby plants can detect these sound waves and they already can also improve their immunity and synthesize chemicals which are deterring these herbivores. And if they were mimicking similar sounds mechanically, the roots, the roots, the plants, nearby plants were not responding. So it was really specific just for the sound waves generated by these caterpillars feeding on leaves. And uh, recently, two papers were published where it seems that these leaf tree trichomes could act as an acoustic antennas in the shoot part. And uh, normally, the leaves and shoots are covered by these trichomes, uh, but uh, normally, plant physiologists were never discussing the possibility that they are important for hearing, but uh, it might be that this, because there is a very, very sensitive change on the shape of these trichomes, and it was also shown that calcium spikes are immediately induced, electrical signals are induced if there is uh, some reflection of these uh, trichomes. The next uh, very interesting paper also published from the group of uh, uh, Daniel Robert from Bristol University. They showed that the uh, flowers are not using only uh, colors and nice shapes uh, to attract insects and of course the nectar, but they navigate the insects also using electric fields. So every flower is inducing its own electric field and they interact with the electric fields around these flying uh, insects and this electric field somehow brings insects closer to the flower, so they are guided by these electric fields. This is the next very surprising ability of the plants. And uh, now I'm going, moving to the last part of my talk where I go a little bit to the stress, uh, biology plant stress, and also to, to these anesthetics. I also already showed you that once touching a maize seedling is enough to induce on the root basis communication from plant to plant, and they inform this information. This paper was published in 1990, and it was quite a shock for the monocular plant biologists and genetists, because also in this case, there was a one touch a day on this plant, and there was no touch here. These two plants have the same age, they have the same soil, they are in the same room, and the only difference between them, and they have the same genetic background, the only difference, one touch a day here, brief touch, and you see after a few days, there is a completely different plant. So the phenotypes of plants is not so much based on the genome and gene expression, or gene expression, of course, could be also involved here, but more on, on the sensory environment, which is around the plant. So the plant morphogenesis and the plant body is really is constructed more on the basis of what the plant is perceiving during her, the lifetime. So the phenotypic plasticity of plants is more based on sensory experiences as on some genetic uh, genome basis. And we also publish a paper where we can show that if we, if we use plants which are in, uh, releasing very strong volatiles, we can shape, change phenotype of the nearby plants also from different species. So even, even the chemical communication is also changing the phenotype completely. And so I'm coming now back to this uh, central topic, maybe interest for Stefan also, <laughs> it's the pain. So what is interesting with plants, they are full loaded with a painkiller. And of course there are, there are several theories, but the dominant now one is that of course, this is by accident of evolution. They have this painkiller and we were lucky enough to find them. So this is the theory, which is maybe dominant now. But our data indicate that the, these painkillers and also anesthetics endogenous, they are synthesized in a very heavy, large amount under stress. So when the plant is in stress, so it must have some function in plants. If it is a relieving of pain in our sense, it is not easy to, to make any final evidence for this. But even on the opposite, no one is able to prove that this is not the case. So we are here in a, some situation where no one can really be sure. But of course, the mainstream science is thinking they have the true and there is no pain in plants. It's not possible because they don't have brain, don't have cortex. But, uh, you know, I think this sense of pain is very important for any organism because in order to survive evolution, you must know what is good and bad for you. And if some 
harm, you are not able to recognize harm, and the pain is just a signal for the harm, then you will be not able to survive in evolution. So you must have this, some kind of a compass. This is good for me, this is bad for me. And this compass then, and pain is important part of this compass, which is then navigating you in evolution. And, but many of these substances uh, plants synthesize also in order to manipulate insects, for example, with caffeine, it is known, and I think Lars Kitka will show also maybe some data on this. So they can control the pollinators just by increasing, decreasing caffeine in the, in the nectar. But they are not just caffeine in nectar. In nectar, there are many, many other substances. What I told you about these ants protecting the acacia tree, in this nectar which they get, the, the ants are getting much more aggressive. So they are really not afraid even of a giraffe, they attack which were not the normal behavior before. So it was only after licking this nectar from the acacia tree. So they are completely pre-programmed and they are able to protect the tree even against the big herbivores. And this is now the data of what our last paper could be published uh, this year. It is still not out, but it will be soon, but it is in press in another button, you can find it there. And of course, there are many, many papers already published that the uh, anesthetics inhibit plant movements. But in this paper, we now use the highest number of plants and we use also different kinds of anesthetics. And we combined uh, cell biology, of course, with the, with the movies, cell biology also, and electrophysiology. And we showed that the uh, ethyl D ethyl ether is in fact also produced endogenously in plants under stress. So, this ether is induced in plants, uh, some stress response, but if you expose the plants to high concentration, it will lose ability to move. In the case of the mimosa, it will not respond to touch or the, or the Dionea carnivorous plants will be not able to close the trap, even if it is uh, an insect there. And the Drosera, P for, uh, Drosera is also not able to roll the leaves until after the insects are there, stick to the leaves and the p drills will be stop moving around, searching the support, mechanical support. So, and in the end, so these organ movements in animals and plants are animated via bioelectricity as it was proposed by Humboldt and uh, uh, of course then later Bose and Charles Darwin too was interested. So in both animals and plants, the action potentials must be there in order that the organ can move and uh, also, interestingly, I told you that the glutamate and GABA are present in plants as a transmitter and they have receptors. In the case of glutamate, it's very similar to human and animal life. In GABA, these receptors look differently, but anyway, they are also acting as inhibitory transmitters in plants and glutamate as excitatory, like it is in animals. So, with this bioactivity, it can be a unif unified sum of this principle. At the end, I just would like to uh, make, uh, make you clear that. These roots are not just in the soil uh, isolated. They, they are connected to the mycorrhiza fungi and they generate huge mycorrhiza root networks, which are covering almost the whole surface of the, our planet because most 90% of uh, plants, they are part of this mycorrhiza symbi symbiosis. So you can see that different kinds of, even different plants from different species are interconnected via mycorrhiza fungi into one network. And uh, this is this mycorrhiza is uh, really growing inside of the root cortex cells, and there is a very very important gap here between the uh, fungi cytoplasm and the host cell root cell cytoplasm. And this interface is having many uh, features which are similar to the synaptic uh, cell cell adhesion domains. So there is a distance is very tightly controlled, and there is exchange not just of uh, water and uh, nutrition, but there is also exchange of transmitter there. So there is a real communication going on. And uh, so this, uh, this uh, mycorrhiza, which started to co-evolve with the, with the plants when the plants were moving from sea to the land. So they were from the very beginning, the mycorrhiza are connected to the plants and mycorrhiza also is not existing without plant. So the mycorrhiza spores germinate only if the root is nearby, otherwise they stay dormant. So they cannot live on their own, these mycorrhiza fungi. So they are also so connected now with the plants that they are not able to live without them. And so this interplant communication 
why this uh, underground common mycorrhiza networks is a new also field which slowly em is emerging and will be very important in the future. And I think that's, a, that's the end of my talk. I would like just give you some background information. So we started this neurobiology initiative in 2005, as I mentioned. I think Stefano is here. Yeah, Stefano is here. This was 2005. We have a second one in uh, 2006 in China. And the third one was in Slovakia, where I'm here somewhere. And we also initiated uh, a journal, which we called Plant Signaling Behavior. And the society was also renamed to Plant Signaling Social Behavior in 2009. And uh, also, I'm organizing this uh, book series in Springer for luck. There are some 32 volumes published since 2009. This is one of the last volumes published this year. And also, if you are interested in these uh, topics, you can look for this movie, Into the Minds of Plants. If you give this title to the Google, you will bring to the, you will can, you can watch the movie. It's from 2008, but the movie is still very, I would say, very updated. And Jacques Mitch, who was the director, is just now preparing the second part of this movie, which will be maybe next year out. So thank you very much. Frantisek, thank you very much. Um, I had no idea. I had lots of food for thought, particularly for somebody who is used to working with animals mainly in an animal welfare. So I look forward to the discussions. Um, we have a question from the floor. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, beautiful work, of course, and extremely thought provoking. There's no question. Uh, there are many themes that were, are going to come up in the discussion, also in your panel. I'm only going to mention a few of them. I'm not going to try to resolve anything. Yes, yes. But one of the triumphs of Darwinism was the, uh, the notion that uh, Dawkins metaphorized as the blind watchmaker. It put aside teleology and intelligent design and allowed it to be reinterpreted as mindless, mindless yes, processes. Yes. Uh, many of the kinds of processes that we admired in evolution overall happen in particular in plants. One of the questions that's going to come up is why would you want to interpret them as being mindful in plants when they're not mindful in evolution? And by mindful, I really mean nothing more nor less than feeling. Yeah. So my, of course, this is not just my, there are several people now who try to change this uh, so-called neo-Darwinistic uh, theory because this was uh, formulated on the basis of, uh, you know, some statistic analysis, analysis of some allele frequency in some ecosystems, but they completely, completely, uh, they treat the organisms like robots. Again, we are back with this question we discussed already. So they treat the organ, this neo is treating organisms like a robots following some very simple algorithm of some distribution of alleles. And they are not somehow aware that these organisms are having their own interests, they have their own history, and they have their own cognition to solve their own problems. And they communicate all the time with all other organisms around. So this is completely out of the this neo-Darwinistic theory, which is now dominating. But uh, there are now strong movement, which I will meet several people in Oxford this September. Uh, if you are interested, you can open the third way. Third way evolution, I think, is the name of the site on the internet. There is some information on this. So these are really people from many, many corners and convinced that this uh, new Darwinistic theory, which is valid now, needs to be updated because it is really out, outdated now. So it's, Your reply just now was about organisms. And my question about was, was about evolution itself. Is evol there an entity behind evolution that of course, treat like the homologue of the plant? Uh, once more, please. Is there an entity behind evolution on Earth, this Darwinian evolution, that we can treat as you are, like the plant, 
with with uh, with positive and negative uh, 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 feelings about what what's good for it and what's bad yes, for yes. it. The answer I, I we we had presumed I don't know what this anti neo Darwinism is is that there is not that it is a a, a mindless feelingless yes, process. But I'm on the opposite side. I would say that it is not mindless. But you replied with organisms, and I'm speaking about evolution. We, uh, we, we, this whole uh, summer school is based on trying to find yeah, a line. But, but you know, every organism is mind, has mind. So there is no evolution without organisms. There is nothing. If you would have no organisms here, there would be no evolution. Yes. So there, I think the organisms are part, active part of an evolution. No, I agree. I completely agree. But uh, but what you said a moment ago was that every organism has a mind. That is controversial. It is controversial, of course, but. Uh, we cannot solve this problem. <laughs> For my, my point of view that every organism has its own model of environment and the model of environment is generated in the mind of the organisms and without having model, the organism is not able to act. And if the model is also not completely okay, then it will be not surviving evolution. So it must have all the living systems which are now here, all the organisms, even bacteria, are having perfect model in their in their minds because they can survive, and they survived until now. Minds, as I said, remains to be established. But models, we know what models are. We know yeah, what but in, this we, know, is... we know what internal models are. And the reason robotics are relevant is because in robotics, it's been shown yeah, that you can. But have... I explained uh, to you that my thinking is that these models are valid for evolution only if they are linked to the sentience and I guess also consciousness. So, and this is uh, something else what we have in the robots, which are our human constructs, very simple, based on very few mechanical parts. And they are not having this biological, you know, background. And I think the membrane, as I told you in my discussion, the membrane is the most critical issue. So you will never have any uh, robot sentient or having any just trace of sentience uh, without the membranes, you know, just when you have, put, when you put together, like in computer, we have some mechanical system putting together, there, according to this, my view, there will be no sentience and then there will be no survival in evolution. So it means that the computer would not be able to reproduce itself, for example. Okay, I, I'm going to leave the microphone because I'm sure that the others have comments and statements as well. Yeah, is there another question from the floor? Uh, yes, hi. hi. Uh, you did mention that the plant could self-recognize itself. Uh, how it does that? I kind of understood that it used its root to communicate with other plants, but what about recognizing itself? Yeah, until now, a few papers on this. Uh, the self-recognition self is on the basis on the roots which release first the volatile and then exudates. And there is some kind of a code. So if the nearby roots is perceiving this volatile exudates, it can det detect, is it a root from the, different root from the same plant or different root from the different plant, but the same species or even different root, different plant, and different species. So, but this was shown for only roots until now and only a few papers. For kin, kin recognition, there are, there are more papers, but also they are based on exudates and mostly in roots, not in shoots. So in this case, the roots seems to be more social uh, part of the plant. And in fact, uh, the real plant, the real most important activities are underground. So what we see, it is just the supporting stuff, you know, leaves generating the photosynthate and the flowers satisfying uh, and allowing reproduction. But the, the real, real creature seems to be underground. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, hi. Uh, I was wondering what, what are the advantages for a paras parasitic weed to mimic its host leaf? So the parasitic leaves are very lazy, so they prefer just to dock on the vascular system and to eat the photosynthate via their roots, but their roots don't penetrate soil, they penetrate the tissue of the host plant, and they dock on the phloem element, and they just get the nutrition. And that gives, that allows them to take the, the shape of the plant's leaf? No, this was the mimicking of the host plant by this vine, tropical vine, 
which is trying to, no one knows why it is mimicking this host three leaves, but maybe it seems to be not visible, you know, so it prefers to add up perfectly to the shape of the leaf and size of the leaf of the host plant. She is just growing around, but this uh, quite long, uh, you know, shoots, so they can be up to three different host plants with different leaf shapes, and it all the time perfectly mimics the one where it's, the leaves is now. Great, thank you. So it's quite mysterious. <laughs> can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> can you say a bit more about how your idea about how the plant avoids that which is punishing for it, so where it would be maladaptive to move towards it, say, and, and that which is going to be rewarding, as in, you know, improving growth and so on. So, so, so have some sort of positive move to, towards it rather than avoid it. So what... No, it, this was the case as the root tips, because the plant as a such is just uh, sessile. It cannot change the position. But the root tip is all the time, you know, moving. Yeah, yeah. But the plant itself is not moving. It is no. just standing there. And the root uh, in the soil is a very dangerous area, and the root is acting as a semi semi autonomous unit. You know, also there are some theories that the plant originally was more simple, and that many units just grow together into one big plant. So the roots are acting as a semi autonomous unit, and their task is to find the nutrition, water, minerals, and the, as a reward, the root will get the sucrose from the phloem. But there seems to be some punishment there if the root seems to be not successful enough to find enough water or enough sucre, uh, minerals, the amount of sucrose provided by the phloem is limited, limited, limited. So, but this is uh, just emerging, it is still not convincingly shown. But there are cases that the root suddenly stops to grow and it is completely, because the plant can make new roots very easily. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as the roots seem to be social, um, were there studies done to see if plant morphogenesis was affected by full isolation? By? By isolation, by isolating a plant from yes. any other plant, for example? Uh, this would be, I think, quite interesting experiment. Until now, you know, these uh, ideas, what I presented here, mostly are not the mainstream idea, so it is not easy to get money for such projects. If you have some donor who will give you money, you can start some experiments. But there are, there are of course, uh, situations where the plants are, when they are together, so for example, when we have also the crop plants, for example, the maize plant, I think it's a quite happy plant, because it is just annual plant, we don't kill the plant at all, we just harvest it when it is over, and together, they are together, we remove all the com competitors around them, as I mentioned, there are some weeds which try to mimic the crop plants. They would like also have this priority to be taken care of them. So, and so maybe we also increase some sociality in this maze by putting them so densely in the field. Because they all the time exchange some information. We have no idea what they talk about all the time, but they are all the time exchanging our information. So if you have some plants alone in your room, sitting alone there, so this may be so lonely plant, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But of course you can speak to this plant and the voice of your, your voice the, is stimulating her, the plant because these waves are inducing and some response. So you can measure in this plant some response, but if it is hearing your, what you are saying, no one knows. But you definitely stimulate the plant by touching or by speaking. Thank you. Hi, thank you Hi. very much. It's really fascinating work. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, why are people so reluctant to say that plants are sentient or conscious? Yeah, this or, is a good question. And, and what would be the implications? Like, if, if your work continues and yeah. people say, aha, plants are sentient, like, what would be the implications yeah, yeah. of that? So this is a very nice, uh, good question. And because in bacteria, there are also many people now studying intelligence in bacteria and uh, the some resistance against intelligent bacteria is much lower, like resistance against intelligent plant, which is a very unique situation. And I think this is something with our mentality and our heritage. And uh, this is my pure speculation, but you know, plants in not so long time ago in many, many societies were treated as a gods. You know, many trees were gods, even in India and also in Europe. Germans have been having gods as a trees 
So maybe we have somehow in subconsciousness, our subconsciousness, some, some reservation against them, and we don't want to have them very sentient because this would maybe place us in a maybe not very pleasant situation. And also the plants are more independent as we are. So of course, maize not, but many plants would survive happily without any human, without, without any animal even. Of course, not the flowering plants, but angiosperm would, they don't need any animals around. So if the all humanity would be gone and all animals, these plants would still happily live further. But if the plants were gone from this planet, we would be out. So we are dependent somehow, we know this subconsciously, and we prefer to keep them as a, some kind of robotic stimulus response system, which are feeding us, okay, but because we are treating them well, because we know how to treat them. And that's why also we say domestication about our crop plants and not coevolution, but it is a for sure coevolution because we are eating them and we don't know exactly what is inside one single to even tomato. We don't know. Thank you very much. What about, um, to, I'm gonna invite Art, I, and you don't get off the hook so easily, Art. Uh, there is a disagreement between you and Art on plants, and there is a fundamental agreement about something even lower down, which you didn't talk about, which is the magic role of the membrane. So can I invite you to say a little bit more about the membrane, why you think it's so yeah, essential, this, uh... and Art to explain why he excludes prejudicially plants um, this from his kingdom. Membrane issue is something which I now just developing the ideas, but uh, the, the, the gener generally the membrane uh, is creating electric field around active membrane. And uh, any, any, any membrane, even, you know, the vesicle itself, but in the eukaryotic cell, we have mitochondria, which are in fact organelles coming from bacteria. So these are also cells the plastids are also cells from evolution uh, taken by the host of the eukaryotic cells. So we have in, in one eukaryotic cell, we have cells within cells and every this uh, cell within cell is generating their own electric field. And my ideas are just because I really cannot go into detail, but my feeling is that the consciousness is linked to this uh, bioelectric activities of membranes, so biological consciousness. Of course, we, maybe sometime we, there will be some computer-based consciousness revolving on this planet using our computers. I don't I disagree, but this will be a completely different kind of consciousness. And we'll be not able, I think, to evolve in evolution by replication. So I don't think this will ever happen with just with computers. Of course, if we make a hybrid where we have uh, living cells and uh, mechanical components, this could work. I think we've got Art taking up the gauntlet yeah, just, over there. Just briefly. Um, Stephen's reacting to a, a paper that I published uh, two years ago now in his journal, his new journal, in which I just summarily excluded plants because it was a lot easier to do that than get into the entire uh, uh, complexities, let's just call it, of the area. Um, I have a new book coming out. Um, I no longer exclude plants. I am now officially agnostic on plants. Um, there are a number of reasons why I have shifted my position a little bit. As any good scholar would, confronted with data, you have to shift your position a little bit. Um, but several things still concern me. Um, one of them is this distinction between um, movement and locomotion. Um, some philosophers in particular, Maxine Sheets Johnstone, make a big point out of movement. And the argument is that you really aren't going to get sentience that is ontologically significant, real, uh, unless you are capable of movement. And so she is pretty dismissive of sessile species, and that of course includes plants. You and your group and many others who are working in with what I, I lovingly call, I, I, lo I love the way you call it, the neurobiology, um, 
suggests that there is motion, there is movement. There is a lot but of the whole plant does not move. And but so also my the whole question, plant. is there a distinction between these two, and is it important? Yeah. Also, the whole plant is moving. We don't see this, but they are all the time moving. They never stop. They stop only when we put them under anesthetic. I could also show you some movie with, for example, these pea tendrils. It's very nice to see. They are completely frozen under anesthetics. And if we remove them, they again start to move. So they move all the time. But sometimes these movements seems to us not very relevant because they are just moving like this. We don't know what does it mean. Of course, the root is all the time moving by looking something or avoiding something. But these but this leaves and shoes, they are just moving like this. They're, it looks like dancing, like if they would dance. But the plant, the plant doesn't do uh, the chicken shtick. It doesn't cross the road. Yeah, you meant locomotion, didn't you? Your question was about locomotion, wasn't it, rather than movement? Yeah. 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 But with speck of locomotion, if you consider this root tip, which is moving really, if you would be sitting in the one of the cell of the root tip, I can make some thought experiment that you are in a, in a rocket as an astronaut, and you are sitting there in this root tip. So you are moving really uh, distances on our, for example, on, on the comparison to your size, it would be 10,000 kilometers. And the speed would be also quite, quite strong because, as I told you, this elongation region is in fact pushing the, the tip. It is like a capsule. It is like a rocket. And the elongation zone cells are doing nothing else, just pushing it forward, all the time forward. And it is a really relatively fast speed. And there must be some navigation to avoid dangerous places and to find the water, to find the minerals with what they need. So it is not easy task of the root tip. I, I, I appreciate that. And, but I it's still a real movement. It's there's, there's still a distinction here that, that it needs to, it's a gap between these two domains and it needs to be bridged. But let me change the topic for one second, okay? <laughs> There's something that uh, also that went by real fast. Um, if, the, if these mechanisms are driven by evolutionary uh, um, um, procedures, uh, then the, um, um, the, the nature of adaptation and natural selection has to come in. These plants that mimic other plants, the standard basis for mimicry is to protect oneself from predation so that you end up looking like something that's dangerous. Is there any evidence of that component being there in these plant mimicry studies? In the case of this uh, Bokila, which is mimicking the host plant leaves, I think it is maybe to be not seen, it's true. But this another mimicry, what I told you about these crop plants, so-called Babylonian mimicry, where the wheat is mimicking the model of the crop plant, and it is not because it would be killed, because this is in the middle of the field. It tries to look like the crop plant. It tries to ha have all the benefits of the crop plant from us to be treated as a crop plant. So you think this is an interaction with human intervention? That without humans you wouldn't see this kind of mimicry? So this would be not uh, not to be seen, but to be seen as a crop plant, you know, opposite. Yeah. So this, this so weed, they are only crop plants that, that no no they only mimic crop plants. They I just mimic crop saying. plant. These are different plants, but they try to look like the crop plant in the middle of the field. You know, if you have wheat field, you will find a lot of lot of other weeds, but you will not recognize them as a weed because it looks perfectly like a crop, like a wheat, or like so, a barley. Okay, so, so again, the, the hard question: Do you find this kind of mimicry under any other conditions? No, no, so this is not studied also properly until now. We know very little until now. Also, this Babylonian mimicry is forgotten. It was studied maybe 60, 80 years ago, and it's forgotten now from the literature. So if you go put Babylonian mimicry in the Google, you will find some old papers, but <laughs> no, one, no one is studying this. Thank you. I think we had another question over there. Okay. Thanks for being here. Your speech Thank was you. very interesting. Yeah, um, after my question is more starts with a comment and leads to a question. So uh, after hearing your speech, it seems the closer we look at plants, the more we see similarities with animal organisms. So that's incredibly interesting. Most likely, it has something to do with the fact that all life must have a common ancestor for sure. Uh, for example, you were uh, talking about Darwin's book. At that around that time, you showed a picture of a tree with a network of roots. I uh, have to say it really captures the imagination. Perhaps you'll agree that it, when I say it reminds me of uh, 
Santiago Ramon y Cajal's first depictions of neural mm -hmm. networks, yeah. right? So it they also terminology is the same because they call it uh, uh -huh. the same terminology. Right. Uh, but another example of this, which you might or might not agree with me, is when you look at the inside of a walnut, it looks like a brain with hemispheres that's, and things that's... like that, for the very same reason, probably. Right. So um, we don't suppose that they have similar functions uh, when we look at the inside of a walnut, right, compared to our brain, even if it probably has that shape because of similar reasons. So um, my question is, I, I think I understood that you view nociception, which is the detection of harm to an organism, as an exact equivalent to the feeling of pain, as, as a direct equivalent to it. Did I understand you right? Or uh, do you really think that uh, it's the same thing that we could experience as complex sentient beings, which we call pain? You really think it's equivalent to nociception? No, I don't think it is the same what we feel as a pain. But so, it what's, is, the, what's the difference in your yeah, opinion? Yeah, there is a difference, but I think uh, it is something very, very, very unpleasant. How, how we cannot define it because you would must you must beat the plant under the suffering, but otherwise, it is something very unpleasant, and the plants do any possible measures to somehow improve situation. But yeah, so you know these words like pain and so love are human loaded because again we started to use them as humans, of course, even without science. Mm -hmm. But then we started to first study first studies were on humans, and there was these religi religious doctrines. And only later we start start to study plants, firstly just as a as a source of uh, painkillers, for example, or some medic, medic, medical plants. You know, as a botanical garden started as a as a at the beginning as a medical collection, plant collections only. And this is how it started slowly. But and surely at some point in evolution, no deception started being felt as pain, since here we are yeah, I think pain, it, right? Do you think it could have possibly started in plants? Do you I think, think this, this, is some, this goes even up to bacteria. I think they also feel that they are in not good situation and they move somewhere else or they mm -hmm. do something. The, but yeah, the question goes to the difference between having a behavioral response and having a subjective experience associated with that. I think that, that's right. what your question speaks to, which You're is where... You're saying it's much, much better. Yeah, but <laughs> so, you know, I do, but, because where we talk about... I talk about it later with, with animals, but, you know, where we talk about animal welfare, that's what it's all about. So we, we think a lot about, you know, why do we worry... When we eat a burger, why do we worry about the meat bit about in it, but not about the tomato? And it's all about the subjective experiences. Yeah, so the behavior response is different on different levels. For example, bacteria has a chemotaxis growing out. The root is doing something similar like bacteria, but on the larger scale, growing away from the danger. And the plant, as a complete, is changing the morphology, for example. So it is changing the phenotype as a response. It's, uh, it's also a behavior, changing the complete phenotype, which is more adapted to this bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for your question. Yes, sorry, another question. Um, it's the first time I hear uh, of locomotion being used as a criteria or link to sentience, so I look forward to hearing more about that as it develops. But the general view is that the centralized nervous system would be what would um, be linked to sentience. So what, what is your thought about that? Because if we look at centralized nervous system, we eliminate a lot of groups, for example, plants, fungi, and, and so on. Yeah. In some sense, uh, it could be proposed, but it's speculation that, the, because of course plants don't have a real central system, but the, the central one of the central system is this phloem. Phloem is having very similar features to axon from animals. It's uh, also electrophysiologically similar and with other properties. So this phloem is linking the whole plant body from the root tip, from every root tip up to shoot tip. And it is one, in fact, one cell, which was created from many cells, but they merge together. So one possibility would be that the plant, if it is having some sense of self as an individuum, then it should be searched somewhere in the phloem, I says. Because these root apices, are, the roots are semi-autonomous organ, or, 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 organs, and they have maybe some sense, sense of stem cells, the root tips, but not of the whole plant. So another possibility is that the, all the root tips together somehow generate some, some super, super uh, 
system because they are interlinked also against with the flow elements, but they are also interlinked via electrical fields and via these volatiles and via these exudates. So it could also be that the whole root system is acting as a brain, but this is a range of speculation. Do we know what controls the phloem? Phloem, no. <laughs> phloem is controlled, of course, by the cells because the phloem is a very strange cell. It is a living cell, but all the nuclei are degraded, so there is no nucleus inside. And they are kept alive by the nearby cells. So it is something similar like, for example, you have neurons in our brains and you have astrocytes. Astrocytes somehow help the neurons to function. So this phloem is one a huge cell without any nucleus, but with full of cytoplasma and full of activities. And the cells lining the phloem are keeping it alive, also helping to run the action potentials through the whole plant. So I would, thinking, I would be thinking that phloem is the central master maybe of the plant. Because phloem also decides which roots will be punished and which not. Thank you, it's fascinating. Yes, you were next, I think. Yes, yes. Um, there's a uh, forest in uh, Utah made of aspen, which is what I read is the heaviest living organism on, on Earth. Yeah. And it's estimated it's 80,000 year old. Could we compare this um, living organism, well, this forest of aspen uh, with the human society? It would be something similar, or the beehive, something like that. So it's many, many trees interacting, but they are connected again by this uh, root mycorrhiza system. They are interconnected. And they are, interestingly, some plants are not connected to this mycorrhiza network. For example, which is very strange, the model system Arabidopsis, the model plant Arabidopsis, never makes contact to the mycorrhiza network. So it is, if, we, if you somehow think about this mycorrhiza root network like, like an internet connecting all the you know, people together for exchange of information, this Arabidopsis plant is very strange. It wants to be alone and not part of the network. It might be that there, there is also some, if you are part of the network, then you must obey some rules maybe. So some plants maybe prefer not to be part of the network. But in the case of this forest, this is uh, acting as a unit, yes. Because these are the same, they are even having the same genome, these trees. So they are also genetically uh, the self. So w would you say that um, this forest or uh, this organism is more adapted than we are? <laughs> That's the question, you know. The plants are more independent, but if they are more adapted, it's difficult to say. But of course, if they are part of the larger, larger network of trees, it is still more robust, robust and resilient, like if it is a single tree somewhere. It's a single tree alone is very um, difficult for the tree to survive. But if it is part of such a huge network, it is much easier. Because I, I always find it amazing that we're supposed to be the most uh, advanced living thing on Earth, but our lifespan is like a hundred years at most. But you yes. have trees at three hundred, yes, so a thousand. This is also maybe one of the subconscious issues why we don't want to have plants sentient because they can live really, really a long time. No, I'm Thank good you. with saying, you know, we are really good at being humans and the trees are really good at being trees and pigs are very good at being pigs. I don't think, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't quite know where we would want to go with you know, in terms of ec ecology, how we would, where we would go with compa comparing adaptiveness. You, I think within a population, you can say some of the un individuals in a particular um, populations are more are better adapted than others, and that's how natural selection moves on. Not quite sure how I sort of go with you know com comparing adaptiveness between different species. Well, my point was depending on what your measurement is, maybe we're not so much uh, superior. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've got two more questions over there. Thank you. Hi, I just Hi. want to say it's a very nice talk. I Thank just you. want to follow up on the pain question. So I'm interested in human emotion, where we can get subjective report from subjects to know exactly what they're feeling. But for other species, I don't find it very helpful that we insist on the feeling, the conscious experience side. 
I was just wondering if we can just describe pain or stress as an emotion state that has negative valence, high arousal, objective measures like that. Can we come up with ways to measure those things in plants to be able to say with much more confidence than feelings that we can conclude that this animal is in a pain or stress-like state? I'm just wondering if you can come up with experiments to measure things like valence and arousal. Yeah. Yeah, so, of course, if we come to emotions, it is even more difficult with plants. <laughs> but uh, again, I think this uh, feeling of a bad situation mm -hmm. must be connected to some kind of uh, something what we call emotion in humans or maybe animals. But this is, uh, again, pure speculation. We don't know. But the plants immediately recognize that something is wrong and immediately starts to do some steps or some decisions to improve situation. So the plants know exactly what is wrong, where it is wrong, and what should what to do. Yeah, so. I, I'm just asking more specifically, can you come up with experiments to like put a number or, or put a quantity on how negative, how positive this is, and how arousal this plant is? I'm pretty sure you can design some experiments, but you need to think about this a little bit longer. So I cannot give you now any oh, sure. any, any good advice. But I, it is it, it is even possible to make very simple experiments with plants in your living room. You know, it's not so difficult. You just need to think about it. Yeah, then why don't people do that? <laughs> some people do that at home just be, just because they like uh, plants. You know, but it is another topic in uh, mainstream plant sciences, unfortunately. These topics are still not uh, completely accepted by the mass. You know, so. Okay, thank you. I guess my question goes uh, a bit towards the same subject. Um, if a plant reacts to getting a limb cut off or getting eaten, and it has a reaction because it's adaptive to do so, so and it's a way to protect itself, I'm wondering if uh, it would react differently, and if you measured it, like uh, let's say that a tomato plant that's get a tomato amputated from it because they need to spread their fruit to reproduce. So getting a branch cut off would not be the equivalent than getting a fruit cut off. So I was wondering if that has been measured or if you think like, because the adaptive consequence of getting amputation would be Could you please repeat the question in a simple way? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was wondering if, um, let's say, a limb amputation and yes. a fruit amputation from a plant would have different reaction yes. if, if that yes. has been mis yeah. measured. For example, this is also a good question because fruit is designed by the plant to be eaten by animals. So this is what they want from us, but they don't want to take the fruit out of the tree if it is not mature. And again, I'm coming to this anesthetic. So the acetylin is one of the anesthetics in plants synthesized with the NH stress, but it is also the central compound which is uh, controlling maturation of the fruit. So when the fruit is matured, it is fully under acetylene anesthesia, presumably. And it is not obviously making any harm to the plant if you take the matured fruit. But if you pick uh, unmature trees, uh, fruits from trees, then you are making some harm, and this they don't like. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you, Francis, and thank you everybody for a really interesting question. It was super talk. Cool.